All right, so last week we talked about waves and how waves travel from one medium to another and how they interact, and we talked about the different parts of waves. So this week we'll be applying all of that information to how sound works, and we'll figure out how uh, each part of the wave allows us to understand a little bit about sound. So first of all, we have a couple of vocabulary words that we haven't really covered yet. Um, from the foldable and there are lots of different types of waves that we'll be talking about in the next few weeks before spring break and when we classify sound sound can be um, described as two types of waves the first way we can describe sound is by saying it is a mechanical wave and remember we've talked about mechanical energy being um, like a an energy that involves moving particles so when we have the word mechanical with the wave, it tells us that there needs to be particles for the sound to move. So um, it requires a medium or it requires matter to travel through. Longitudinal waves describe the type of shape that the sound wave takes. And longitudinal waves move particles of the medium parallel to the direction in which the waves are moving. So in this picture here, um, you may have seen a tuning fork before, you may not have, but this little object is a tuning fork and when you um, hit it against a surface like a table or a wall, it makes this sound and it's called a tuning fork because you can tune your voice to this sound or guitar strings and basically we have this image here that is zooming in on the sound particles or the the molecules that are being compressed together and then there are some spaces that are left in between and what's happening here is as the particles are vibrating they're moving out um, away from the tuning fork kind of in a ripple pattern the way that the water moved in the tanks last week so it's moving in the same direction as the energy of the wave itself. So those two lines are parallel to each other. Um, longitudinal waves have to have a medium to travel through. So that's why longitudinal and mechanical go hand in hand. One thing that's interesting is that um, this picture here, someone pointed out that it looks like a minion today, which made me excited. Um, but it's actually a, uh, a bell that's inside of a glass jar. And the idea is that all the air and matter has been taken out of the jar. It's kind of been sucked out like a vacuum. And what's interesting is that if there is no matter for the sound to travel through, then you can't hear anything. So technically, out in space, you can't hear anything. So if any of you have seen the movie Gravity, or you've seen at least the trailer, um, some kind of preview for that movie, um, spoiler alert, there are some explosions that take place in the movie, and, and when you're watching it, there's a lot of the sound effects that go along with the explosions. It makes you feel really nervous about what's going to happen to the astronaut. But if we were really there and if we could have our masks off in space and we could still breathe, we wouldn't be able to hear anything, which is pretty interesting. So if the movie wanted to be really technical and make us feel like we were there, then a lot of it would have been silent instead of having all the sound effects for the explosion. So fun fact for you. Um, so in terms of sound waves and how we would draw them out, it's going to look a little different from what we've been doing in class lately. Uh, lately, we've been doing uh, drawing waves so that they have this little wavy pattern here. Um, and this is a type of wave we'll talk about in class over the next few days that deals with light. So sound waves, like we just said, um, and, you know, in cartoons, you might have a little stick figure, some kind of person, and we can, like, have... Um, these little lines to show sound coming out of them. And so this the lines represent the air molecules that are being compressed together. So the different parts of the wave in terms of sound waves would be compressions and rarefactions. So compression is a part of the wave where the particles are close together. So when we compress something, we push it tight. Rarefactions are the places that are spread out. So here in this picture points the the compression versus the rarefaction. We're going to do a lab together with slinkies where we're going to demonstrate this and, and write out the different parts of these waves. So when we are um, drawing, the, drawing these out and trying to compare them to the vocabulary we've learned so far, the distance between compressions would be considered the wavelength. And then how much is actually being compressed tells us about the amplitude of the wave. Now amplitude in terms of sound tells us how loud 
the sound is or how soft the sound is. So the further away that the molecules move away from rest tells us that it would be a really loud sound. So if any of you have ever like been listening to your music on the computer, I know that Windows Media Player has a setting where you can um, kind of see the effect of the sound in a visual way. And so a lot of times if you have loud music, you'll see the graphics move really far away from their resting positions. And if it's a quieter sound, all of the graphics will be kind of close together to show that there's not a lot of movement of the molecules going on. So if you have um, Windows Media Player or some other type of music player on your computer where you can see that, it kind of explains the uh, picture that you see. Now wavelength, again, measures the distance between one compression and another. So when we uh, draw our pictures, especially tomorrow with our lab on Slinkies, um, you're going to see waves being drawn like this. So if you can imagine all of these lines are kind of connected, just like a slinky would be. Again, anytime everything's going to clump together is a compression. So from one to another is a wavelength. And then line density means basically whenever the lines are super close together. That shows me the amplitude of the wave. Now frequency tells me how many vibrations are happening every single second. And remember that their frequency is measured in hertz. And in terms of sound, this tells us what the pitch of the sound is. And if you've ever been in music class or in band, you may have heard this word before. If you haven't, um, pitch just means how high or low the sound is, like in terms of the note. So a higher sound or a higher note is uh, typically done by women. Some men can do it too, um, but the lower notes are usually done by the men. So a lot of the instruments that some of you play in band play on this idea of um, extending the length of air going through an instrument. So this example here is of a trombone. And as a person playing the trombone extends their arm and makes the slide part longer, they actually um, increase the wavelength of the air that's going through the instrument. And that makes us have a lower sound. So if any of you have band instruments, um, if Miss Gruber is okay with you bringing in your band instrument, you are more than welcome to bring that in over the next couple of days, and we can actually have some in-class demonstrations talking about how the way your fingers are over the air holes um, can affect the way that the sound is. So I think it would be interesting if some of you did that. Just come and let me know during homeroom so I can expect that for class. So finally, we've also talked about speed in the past week when we related it back to wavelength and frequency. And in terms of sound, speed depends on the medium or the matter that it's traveling through. And it also depends on temperature, which I think is interesting because we've talked about these things um, independently of each other. And now we'll, we'll bring it all together with sound. So sound is going to travel faster through more dense material. The reason is because when we've got those molecules packed in more tightly, when we add a disturbance or we add a sound to it, those molecules are going to hit each other a lot faster in a domino effect because they're closer to each other. Sound is also going to travel faster in higher temperatures than lower temperatures, and that also has to do with the motion of those molecules. When those molecules are already moving really quickly, they're going to be more likely to bump into each other faster than the sound would at a lower temperature. This is going to end this segment of the video. Some classes were not aware of this and got the notes today and probably thought like, oh my gosh, we're going to have a lot of homework. Um, but we're going to end it here and then we're going to pick up with a second video tomorrow. So that way we can lighten the load a little bit and take this a little bit slower. So just be prepared to come in tomorrow and apply some of this information in our class and in our lab that we'll do with Slinkies. And um, just be ready to show me these notes and have any questions um, to discuss in class with us. Have a good evening.